Uh, I'd like to thank Simon and Viz Asia for their support, ongoing support, long-term support for the Sydney Asian Art Series and for the Power Institute. And I'd like to thank the Power Institute also and the Art Gallery of New South Wales, as well as the University of Sydney for their support for the program, uh, the series, I should say. I'd also like to acknowledge with Simon, the uh, Gadigal nation of the Gadigal people of the Yora nation on whose unceded land we live and work and on which the University of Sydney now stands and the Power Institute and the Art Gallery. So as Simon mentioned, uh, the series this year, we've been focused very much on, so we've taken a slightly different approach this year with the series. I should mention as well that uh, I've been co-convening it with uh, Dr. Olivia Krishe, who has been doing it a lot longer than me. He's going to be joining us slightly later on. He's currently teaching, but he'll be with us a little later. So the theme for the Sydney Asian Art Series this year is Kura, which we've split into these sub-themes of collection, community, and care. Collection being the, the sub-theme that we're looking at in 2023. So the broad idea for the series this year was to think about ideas of provenance issues, to think about the establishment of new exhibition spaces like the Cha Chakwi Museum at the University of Sydney, as well as the Sydney Modern Project at the Art Gallery of New South Wales, to try and tap into some of those conversations that are happening around these things, to think through their relevance for Asian art, their relevance for Asian art history. The specific uh, theme of collection, this year we're, we're thinking very much about collecting histories, which is very relevant to today's tonight's talk, uh, provenance issues, markets, economies. I won't delve too much into the themes for the next couple of years because that would be giving it away, I feel. Uh, I should note as well that um, before we get into things, I'm going to start with a little Q&A with uh, Stacey in a, in a couple, in a minute or so, in lieu of a more, I suppose, conventional uh, introduction where I might just read her bio. But we do that because we, we feel it's more engaging. It's a chance to kind of get to know the speaker before they launch into the talk. It's more conversational. Uh, it's a way to, to really get to know the speaker in a way, I suppose. But before I do go into that, I should note that we use a Q&A function during these talks. So you'll see a little button down the bottom of the screen that says Q&A. And you can put your questions in there throughout the, the time. And then at the end, either myself or Olivier will mediate a little Q&A session after the talk. And we'll, um, we probably won't have time to go through all the questions, depending how many there are. But we'll pick those, I guess, that we think are perhaps something that everyone might want to, to hear Stacey respond to, and those that we think will open up the conversation in interesting ways. But feel free to put them in there, and we'll, we'll record them afterwards. We'll note them down, and we'll, we'll send them to Stacey. So if they'll all get answered, hopefully. But without further ado, it's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Stacey Pearson. I will briefly note that Stacey is Professor of the History of Chinese Ceramics at the School of Oriental and African Studies, University of London. That's all I'll note. Um, uh, welcome, Stacey. It's wonderful to have you here. I'm a great fan of your research. Um, I'll launch into the questions so that we can get talking. So you've taken on a series of academic as well as curatorial roles over the past several decades, starting with the Museum of East Asian Art in Bath, and then moving, of course, to the Percival David Foundation, which is the subject of your talk, or Percival David is the subject of your talk tonight, and then the School of Oriental and African Studies, first as Deputy Head of Museums before you joined the Department of Art and Archaeology. So I wondered if you could tell us a little bit more about your career journey across those, those institutions. Thank you very much, Alex. And um, before I answer your question, I'd like to thank you, Olivier, and the Power Institute for inviting me to participate in this series. Um, it really intersects with so much of the work that I'm doing at the moment. So thank you very much. Um, in answer to your question, obviously, this wasn't a kind of planned trajectory. Um, you know, it's not like a medical career or something like that. But looking back, um, I very much saw myself more as a curator than an academic, at least for the first half of my career. And so my first museum job effectively was at the Museum of East Asian Art, which was founded by a collector who'd been based in Hong Kong. 
and very much wanted to obviously bring his collection from Hong Kong, but share it in a very famous city, Bath, which is not known for Asian art. So that was a really good starting point for me. Also, it's a very small museum. So it was very hands-on for me. I basically did everything. And about a year after I started there, I got a phone call from SOAS where there was something called the Percival David Foundation of Chinese Art and where I had previously done my MA degree, concentrating on that. And they were just about to create a new position as assistant curator. And so I was so excited, I dropped the phone. I couldn't believe it because as a ceramic specialist, that was a dream. Um, so I was very lucky I got that job. And so I came to SOAS, came back to SOAS then, and I spent effectively the rest of my museum career at the PDF, as we called it. Um, and then when it closed, um, I was already embedded in the university. So a um, teaching position was created that I interviewed for, unfortunately got. And so there's been some continuity in the sense that I've always been at the same place. Um, but instead of um, being responsible for the stewardship of the objects, I now teach them. Um, and so I think it fulfills Percival David's aims of you know, wanting to bring his collection to um, both general public and to students. That's an enviable career trajectory um, from, to move from such, and the Museum of, I mean, the Museum of East Asian Art has such wonderful collections as well as the Percival David Foundation. I'm quite jealous. <laughs> um, so moving on, throughout that time, you've also authored a series of really field-defining texts from Earth, Fire and Water, Chinese Ceramics Technology, a handbook for non-specialists back in 1996, through several monographs and edited volumes charting the collection of Chinese art, and especially ceramics, of course, from the 16th century right down to the present, to your brilliant analysis, in my opinion, of the discursive construction of Ming porcelain in From Object to Concept, Global Consumption, and the transformation of Ming porcelain in 2013. So I was wondering, what are some of the key themes, I know it's a huge question, but what are some of the key themes and considerations that you think run through this record of publication? Yeah, that's an interesting question, um, because it's not often that I look back and think of my publications as like a body of work. Um, but I guess if I do, there's really, like a, I guess there's a loose Chinese art framework um, that supports what I do, but I think I think my main object, my main interest is really in objects and also then people as they relate to objects. So, um, I mean, it's a very curatorial thing to say, of course, I'm into objects, but, but that was my start as well. I became a ceramic historian and my route into that was I was really interested in the materials and techniques the technology. Um, I had done a bit of science in my first degree and decided I didn't want to be a scientist. But when I discovered ceramics, it was the perfect way of kind of marrying the two, particularly because of, you know, there's really sophisticated glazes and um, decorative techniques. So with objects, my aim has really been to explore how they are made and the impact that has on their visual appearance, but also their reception, how people engage with these objects. And by extension, I guess I started looking at people's encounters with objects, um, initially ceramics, but widening that out as well. And the way that this had an impact on the objects themselves, but also the people in their communities. So the intersection of the two um, really kind of comes together in my latest work, which focuses a bit more on collecting and collecting histories. So yeah, I guess if I had to sum it up, um, that would be how I would characterize the main themes in my work. Saying that, I mean, it hasn't been a linear trajectory, um, but, and I have had to move into areas that are way out of my comfort zone, as you will hear in the lecture, um, but they all really come together, I think, in those themes. That's really interesting to hear you mention the, the interest in objects, I think, and um, the relation of objects to people, because, I mean, I, I like to call myself a ceramics historian as well, obviously not up to your level quite yet, but getting there, I hope, um, and I think that's something that perhaps unites people who study ceramics and other types of art which are so close to, 
to the body perhaps and to the kind of the tactile nature of, of those materials is that real interest in in the object and in the material the making of things and that kind of thing so it's really interesting to hear you say that my students um you know the hands-on experience um and the 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 materiality of the object is so central to how people respond to them um and and to ceramic as a medium as you said but of course what we're talking about tonight is is collection histories and um the 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 link between i suppose different ways of writing about biographies and writing about the the life histories of people and objects uh, i did have another question but i think it might tread on the toes of your talk a little so we might move straight into the talk to give you as much time as you need i think right um, i'll hand over to you right so as alex said uh, my talk tonight um focuses on collecting in particular the collector whose collection has really shaped my professional world um but also the academic field um, in which I work. And so I have titled it The Man Who Loved China because that was really central to who he was. And so for those of you who may not be familiar with him, Percival David is the creator of something known as the Sir Percival David Collection, which today is on display in this beautiful gallery uh, that you see here in the British Museum. For a long time, it was based at SOAS in my university in a, in a much less glamorous but charming space. <laughs> and it moved to the British Museum in a new gallery that opened in 2009. So it is a world famous collection and it is one of the finest collections of Chinese ceramics bar none really i mean it's as it's as good as those that are still in the former palace collection but i started working on percival david's collection as i said briefly in the introduction in 1995 so i was responsible for it as an assistant curator and then the main curator and i remember when i came to the museum um we had some information about him as a person but I felt a little bit dissatisfied because the story was somewhat superficial. So behind the scenes, I started working on kind of researching the collector. And I discovered very early on that there was a reason why it was fairly superficial. And that's because he didn't, um, he didn't really keep an archive. So there is no Percival David archive, a personal archive. Um, and I think that was intentional. So I've had to really over the years look sideways into him as a person and doing that has made me reconsider the collection as well. So that's what I'm gonna share with you this evening. So one of the um, other discoveries I made is that there is very much a kind of official or authorized history of Percival David. And I'm gonna start with that, outlining the main events in his life. And we will also then look at the collection briefly. So if we take a look at his life, um, quite straightforwardly, he was born in India in, as it was then, in 1892. And he moved to London in 1912 and started collecting in 1914 with a ceramic purchase. So he bought, I think, four pieces of Chinese ceramics in 1914. Moving into the next decade, he bought a country house and settled there in 1920. And in 1926, his father died and he inherited the family business and also his father's title. He was a baronet. And so um, young Percival became Sir Percival David in 1926. He then mainly on behalf of the business began traveling extensively to places all over Asia, also Europe and the United States. And he also began doing fairly substantial philanthropic works. The 1930s, he was, I suppose, his most active um, as a collector. He starts engaging with universities and museums on a very large scale. And he also joined a lot of collector groups and was really active in them, including the Oriental Ceramic Society. Um, full disclosure, I'm currently the society's president. <laughs> 
Um, he also then expanded the scope of his collection to include Chinese books. And he was really traveling extensively, particularly around 1934 to 35, because he was planning a major exhibition of Chinese art in London that opened at the end of 1935. During World War II, um, he stored his collection outside of London at the country estate and was traveling on behalf of his company to offer assistance with aircraft building. So I will say more about that because this, this is what how it's described in the official history. This meant that he did arrive in Shanghai in December 1941, shortly after the bombing of Pearl Harbor. And so he was placed under house arrest. And at the same time, his health seemed to be really suffering because he had this undiagnosed condition. But somehow he then under house arrest, but he's still able to collect. So 1942, he's released with other um, prisoners in Mozambique. Um, this is before the internment camps were established. So he was house arrest, released with other prisoners and ended up in South Africa. And he decides to stay there with a friend um, to recover from whatever this illness is that he has. And it turns out he discovers he has ALS, which is a motor neuron disease. And so he really starts, I think, starts to feel like he may not be long for this earth and he wants to find a permanent home for his collection. So ultimately he donates the collection of ceramics to the University of London. And in 1952, a museum opens um, of his collection, the Percival David Foundation of Chinese Art at SOAS. Um, SOAS doesn't own the collection. It was donated to the University of London and then SOAS administered it. So it became a department of SOAS, if that makes sense. Then in 1953, he married um, Sheila York Hardy, who'd been his companion for many years and made her not only Lady David, but also the first curator of his museum. And he also lived on site. There was an apartment at the top of the building that he lived in. Um, and the reason he lived there is because he was wheelchair bound. Um, and so they were able to install a lift, an elevator in the building for his use and it made life a lot easier for him. He did continue to be active in the field. He was publishing research, traveling when he could, but his health really was declining. And in 1965, 64, he died of complications of ALS and he was survived by his wife, Lady David. The museum remained at SOAS, as I mentioned, until 2008 and now it's in the whole collection is in a dedicated gallery in the British Museum, room 95, if you want to look it up. So that's the authorized version um, the, with, based on information provided by Lady David, mainly through um, you know, what Percival David had shared with her, what she had experienced with him before he died. And there's also therefore an official Percival David collection. And this is the one that was defined by him in his museum. So when we talk about the Percival David collection, that is the collection we refer to or that everyone thinks of. And this collection was um, edited by him specifically for this donation and for the creation of a museum collection. So it consists primarily of Chinese ceramics dating from the period 10th to 18th century. For those of you who know Chinese history, that's Song to Qing dynasty. And the reason it focuses on this is because it reflects what was in the imperial collection. So he very much focused on imperial ceramics, um, apart from perhaps the most famous pieces in the collection, I think you can see here on the right, is a pair of blue and white temple vases that are dated to 1351. Um, there's a little inscription on the neck that has a date in them. So they were made for a temple, not the court, um, but everything else is effectively um, representative of imperial ceramic. So within this, he acquired some of the finest pieces, some of the rarest pieces, but as a whole, they really tell a story of 
Chinese ceramics, their production, their design, the aesthetics from the 10th to the 18th century. One of the, well, this is always a fun game to play. So if you look at this screen, um, I mentioned one piece that's extremely valuable, but it might surprise you that the, the plainest piece on this screen is perhaps the most valuable piece in the collection. So that's this bowl on the top left. And this was aware that it's extremely rare that David um, knew about because of his research interest. And he also had the money. He was fabulously wealthy. So he was able to acquire them when they came up for sale. And another piece that is probably quite famous, mainly because it, it's just so beautiful. We used it all the time in all of our publicity materials and the British Museum does that as well. So that's the bottle that you can see here on the bottom right with the birds and flowers. So it is an unparalleled collection, as I said, um, extremely high quality. He wanted it to be used for teaching and available to the public in the museum. And that aim was fulfilled very successfully. And I am evidence of that. But what is a little confusing is that um, there may actually be more to it than, than we think. And one of the ways I think you can think about the value of the ceramics collection and why that has taken priority over other things that I will tell you about is um, to look at just how important some of his pieces are today as benchmark objects. And by that, I mean the ones that are compared to, you know, often wishfully by collectors and, you know, auctioneers. And a good example of that is what you see here on the screen. I took this from, there was about a week ago, an, a Chinese art auction in Hong Kong, in which the bottle on the right featured as um, a single lot. So um, I think it sold for, let me think, something like 40 million Hong Kong dollars. So I don't know what that is in Australian dollars, but it's like about 4 million pounds, you know, which is not record breaking, believe it or not, but it's significant. But in order to promote this piece, look what they were comparing it to. The beautiful bottle that we used all the time in our publicity. Um, here they're trying to show the difference in scale, but you can see the designs are very similar. Um, and clearly that comparison helped to um, sell this piece. So it is still a benchmark collection in the ceramics world and in the world of Chinese art. But it's not necessarily the whole collection because what I discovered over time or, or really realized over time is that this was the museum collection. And so that collection's life really starts in 1950 when it was gifted to the University of London. So, you know, it was heavily curated, heavily selected, and therefore became the official Percival David collection. But what I wanted to find out was what he was collecting and how he was collecting it up to that date, because he would briefly mention rare Chinese books and those also were donated to the University of London. So we knew that he was acquiring those and by extension, he could read Chinese um, and he'd used them quite a lot in his research. But I found by looking sideways that his name would pop up in other areas of collecting, sometimes surprising areas. So over time, what I've tried to do is piece together um, the other collection so that we can consider the, the full scope of his collecting activity, because I think they very much reveal more about who he was. So what else was he collecting? Sadly, stamps, and I say sadly because it's an area I know nothing about. But when it comes to stamps, Percival David has a reputation as great as he does in 
the collecting world for Chinese ceramics, which I only recently discovered. And he was collecting primarily Chinese stamps. And some of them are extremely valuable. And when they come up for sale, the David provenance is always mentioned. So there was a sale in 1962, I believe, that was called the David China. And so that gives you a sense of just how important his name was in the stamp world. And so if you look at the stamp, which is obviously blown up, but look at the stamp in the center, this one, that one sold, I think as for a record price, that was something like, Six million Hong Kong dollars in uh, 2019. So his eye for stamps um, was perhaps as finely tuned as it was for ceramics. But it's not just stamps. He also collected the map you see on the left, which is now in the library at Brown University in the US. He collected the globe that you see on the right, which is in the British Library. The map is um, a world map that I think is the first um, Turkish language map that was made for the Ottoman court. And it's extremely valuable as a kind of map of Mundi and it's known as the Haji Ahmed map. I have to track down when he bought it. I'm not entirely sure, um, but it is or was part of his collection. And the globe on the right is the first Chinese globe um, or the earliest surviving Chinese globe. And it was produced in 1623 in China, but not by Chinese um, cartographers. It was produced by two Jesuit cartographers. And that um, I believe he purchased in 1938. So what else, lacquer, he collected very important lacquer pieces that were Chinese, including the lacquer bowl stand that you see on the left, which recently sold for a record-breaking price, I think a couple million pounds, you know. Um, and the tray on the right, that's a detail of a much larger piece, also recently sold for a very high price. Now those complement the ceramics, certainly in terms of their imperial association, their designs, and of course they are Ming. Um, but he also collected jade and jade was something he seemed to have collected earlier in his collecting career. These two pieces are now in the Fitzwilliam at one of the University of Cambridge Museum. And he acquired them in China, I believe in 1924. And then gave them perhaps in exchange for something else to his great friend, the collector Oscar Rafel. And it was through Rafel's bequest that they ended up in the Cambridge Museum. But these are both imperial jades with imperial inscriptions on them. And then you have these two pieces. So he was interested in metal work. And I'm, I just recently discovered yesterday that he was also buying, I believe, um, English silver. I came across a reference to some silver purchases that I'll have to update this with. But for the most part, it appears that he was collecting maybe Chinese metalwork, including um, cloisonne enamel, like the piece you see on the right, and the silver cup that you see on the left. Most of the Percival David enamel pieces ended up in Zurich in the Museum Rietberg because they were collected by um, a collector called Pierre Uldry, um, but they are also imperial. The cup on the left, um, it, it's, it's dating is somewhat disputed today from what I understand, but it has an inscription on it that dates to the 1345. And it's extremely rare and it's now in the Cleveland Museum of Art. Now this cup, was one of the items that Percival David loaned to the 1935 exhibition of Chinese art that I mentioned. And it's through that that I found um, a video of 
first of all, David. So uh, this is the only surviving video of him that I know about. Um, it's it's quite a short piece. I'm going to try and play it for you because the one object that is focused on in this film, which is showing the setting up of the exhibition in 1935 is that silver cup. So um, I'll just see if that's going to work. Various government departments have done splendid work in the cause of art by their active part in the arrangements for the exhibition of Chinese art at the Royal Academy, held under the auspices of the British and Chinese governments. Most of these superb treasures come from the Chinese imperial collections formerly housed in the Forbidden City at Peking. These beautiful works of art, some of them as much as 3,000 years old, make this exhibition one of the most beautiful and remarkable ever held in London. So I hope that was, you were able Various to see that. Oh, sorry. Have done... I hope you were able to see that because it focused on um, the, the little cup at the end of it. And David appears in it. Um, he was the very sort of tiny gentleman standing to the right. Um, when they were unpacking objects. So that's the only known film, I think, of Percival David, but it also demonstrates how significant he was um, for that exhibition, which I will talk about a bit more later. So back to his collection, we know that he collected rare books, um, including books that are some of the earliest surviving printed books, printed books in color, that is printed books from China. Um, and these three are were given to uh, the university as part of the kind of rare book collection that David also included in his gift. That these are for Chinese book people, these are really important texts. And he also collected paintings. And these paintings are today in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Um, in New York. One of the most important ones, these are all short details, small details of bigger paintings, by the way, is the one on the right, which he acquired in China that had been in the Imperial Collection, which many of these seals indicate. And David collected paintings fairly actively when he could. And he once said that he thought that in fact it was the paintings that were the most important aspect of his collection, which is surprising because we always think of him as a ceramic collector primarily, but he did, um, or Lady David included this painting as part of the ceramics collection after he died. And this painting, because it features ceramics, it was, was seen to complement these ceramics that were on display. And um, this is a very small detail of a scroll painting that is 30 meters long. So it too is on display in the Percival David Gallery, but only a small section of it is displayed at any given time for conservation reasons, but it's an imperial painting. So very much in keeping with his um, approach to collecting. And it does feature pieces which may indeed be some that are in his ceramics collection. So we have paintings too, but then I discovered this. And this, this one, I don't really know what to do with. <laughs> um, I'm sure classic car people will be able to tell me something about this. It might be quite exciting, I don't know. But I discovered that this Cadillac was ordered by Percival David, um, possibly as a gift to his wife, Lady David. And it, was shown in a um, magazine article in 1931. So, you know, he, he obviously ordered this, especially. Um, it has a custom body, which apparently is made by some famous coach works, I think in London. But this too was part of his collection. So I don't really know what to make of it. Um, I think it speaks to his collecting environment, in fact, and um, his collecting world, which is how I would like to now think about his collection. So bearing in mind, what I've just shown you is very much the official collection. And then what I've been able to discover, he was collecting in addition to the ceramics. And he, would have told us about those collections if he wanted to. Um, he was actively publishing. He did write a little bit about um, the books that we knew about. Um, but 
there must be a reason why he didn't share the the full scope of his collection and he a reason why he wanted his museum legacy that collection to be focused on a, a single medium because he himself said that paintings were his his sort of pride and joy if you will as a collector so when i've been trying to think about how to fit the other collections into his story i thought i might borrow a a sort of critical framework from art history. And that's Danto's concept of art world in which art is defined by its context. So I'm thinking that maybe we could define David's collection in the same way through a kind of collecting world notion in which the collection is defined by the collecting context. So, in order to do that, I've broken this down into what I will call five activity spheres. And so what I'd like to do now is take you through these five and see if at the end of it, it paints a more, a fuller and much more detailed picture of David and his collection, plural, and whether that might be a better framework for um, interpreting him as a collector and his collection. So, this is not the authorized version. So this is a version that I've been able to piece together over 20 years of not full-time research, but um, research looking into all sorts of areas. So the first kind of activity sphere is this one, so family, home, and social life. And what I discovered about him was that he came from a really important family. <laughs> um, and it's looking back, it seems so obvious because his father, the gentleman you see in the center there, his father's name was Sir Sassoon Jacob David. And therefore, Percival David was a Sassoon. And in fact, his mother was Sassoon royalty, effectively. Um, she was the granddaughter of the founder, the man, David Sassoon, who's considered the founder of the dynasty. Um, as it was established after the Sassoons and other Jewish families left um, Iraq when it was under Ottoman rule and moved to um, India and then from there other places. So he was a Sassoon, which explains a lot. Um, he also, as the car picture suggests, had a first wife. Um, so I discovered that there were two Lady Davids and the first Lady David was Vera Moselle who was also his first cousin. Um, and marrying in that, marrying a close relative was not necessarily that unusual in families like that. Um, so the woman we know as Lady David, Sheila, was actually his second wife. I also discovered his brothers-in-law, who I guess were also his first cousin, were extremely important in two other areas. Um, and they all lived together in the house you see here at the bottom, which I will say more about in a moment. So one brother-in-law was instrumental in photographic reconnaissance during the Second World War and a colorful person who was best friends with and worked with Charlotte Churchill, Churchill's daughter. His other brother um, was a great is a big name, brother-in-law, I guess, a big name in the polo world, Archie David. There's something called the Archie David Cup. Um, he created a polo team in the house they all lived in. And this then became the founding team for the guards polo team, which Prince Philip played in and all that. So quite important. He also had, David had very interesting friends. And if we look at friends, this is just a, a small sample of them. They helped characterize his world. So Oscar Rafel, the collector I mentioned, who gave the jade to Cambridge, is one. Um, the Chinese photographer, Long Jing Shan, is another. Um, the Crown Prince of Sweden was a great friend of his, as was Reginald Johnson, who had been the tutor to the last emperor, Pu Yi, and also had worked at SOAS. And we need to look at David's working life as well, because he was chairman of Sassoon, J. David and Co. from 1926 when his father died. The company had offices all over, including in Bombay, Hong Kong, Shanghai, and Kobe, Japan. 
And it was very successful, founded with um, on the back of the family fortune derived from the opium trade, as well as textiles, and they traded munitions and were influential in banking. His father was one of the founders of the Bank of India. So I think that says a lot too about the circumstances in which he was collecting. He was actively participating in lots of um, membership organizations and clubs like the Athenaeum, which is a famous gentleman's club in London. You can see um, the entrance hall down there on the left. He was a member of a club that I wrote a book about called the Burlington Fine Arts Club, which was a very significant um, membership group for the history of exhibitions and art history. As I mentioned, he was a member of the Oriental Ceramic Society, but also the Society of Antiquaries, the Royal Anthropological Institute, the Royal Society of Arts, and the Royal Philatelic Society of London, as in stamps. And it turns out he was president of it at one stage. Part of me, though, would rather focus on where he lived, because I actually think it is quite important, but it's, it's so interesting. And I think it reveals so much about who he was. So, um, his homes were um, the country house that I mentioned that he bought, which wasn't named until I discovered it. And he had a London base at the Dorchester Hotel in um, Park Lane, which had opened in 1930, I think. So I need to say a few words about Friar Park because <laughs> it's a really interesting place. First of all, it is famous now because it was the home of um, George Harrison, one of the Beatles. There's his wife, um, Olivia, down here, um, who still lives there. And I don't know if you know, but if you look back into the news, um, George Harrison was attacked by a knife man um, in the house. So ever that was like in the 1980s, I think. Ever since then, you know, security has been unbelievably tight there. So I've never had a chance to visit the inside of the house. But in its day, Friar Park was also famous, really as soon as it was built. And it was built in the late 19th century as a sort of Gothic revival palace, as you can see here in the main picture, on 62 acres of, um, or set in 62 acres of fabulous garden. And the gardens were all themed. So there was um, an alpine garden, which you can see Olivia in on the right. And behind her is a miniature version of the Matterhorn. There was a Japanese garden, which you can see on the left. There was a um, Renaissance garden, an Elizabethan garden. I mean, dozens of gardens. The landscaping was also filled with caves and lakes. Truly extraordinary. And really important in garden history and in the garden world. So the gentleman who built it, Frank Crisp, died, I think in like 1918 or something, and the estate came up for sale and Percival David bought it in 1920 and moved in with his wife and his brothers-in-law. And it um, not only looks extraordinary on the outside, but on the inside, it is extraordinary. It is designed to look like a medieval monastery, but you know, through a very Victorian lens. And so it's called Friar Park, not because there was a monastery on the site, but because that's the decorative theme, Friars. So um, if you look at this um, brochure for the estate that I think was published in, let's say 1915 or something, um, you can see a statue there illustrated. Well, there's statues of friars all over the house um, and friars are decorative motifs everywhere too. Now I mentioned this because Percival did, David didn't change a thing. So I think the design, the style and the content of this place really helped to define David's identity. Um, and he was clearly very proud of it. As soon as he bought it, he maintained the tradition of opening the gardens to the general public. 
who would pay and then the money would go to charity. Um, they, he hosted lots of events there. Um, he was very proud of this place. And I also think it's significant that it has these multiple garden spaces because I personally think of gardens as collecting spaces. And I would argue that the gardens at Friar Park were a collection that he acquired. So I think this is really important to who he was and as a background and a particular context to his collecting activities. So how was he collecting? I mean, in addition to buying a complete collection of gardens, if you will, um, I discovered that it wasn't most likely wasn't ceramics he bought first. I think it was stamps. Um, I have recently found a reference to him starting a stamp collection in 1913. I need to verify it, but I think it makes a lot of sense in light of what we know now. But he did then buy ceramics in 1914 um, and he, he bought his first rare books in 1918. And he bought from dealers and shops in London. He bought from dealers and shops in New York. He bought when he was in Shanghai, Hong Kong. He bought from quite a few Japanese dealers as well. These are these two are quite famous names in um, the Japanese art world, Yamanaka and Maiyama. He bought at auction. Um, often he would buy at auction other people's collections too. So he, he wasn't always buying individual things. So he bought a stamp collection belonged to someone called Agnew. He bought ceramics that had been collected by um, his older colleague, George Jimarfopoulos, um, a book collection formed by Lockhart and of course, Fire Park Garden. He would also buy one-off pieces, um, including there was some, something that's still in the collection today. It's a mounted main bowl called the Leonard Cup, which he paid 1,100 pounds for in 1932, which is very expensive. And he was buying whenever he was in China for business through kind of um, alternative means, you know, fellow collectors. Um, he bought a group of pieces from a bank, which turned out to be the Sassoon Bank, and they had been put deposited there as collateral for a loan to the imperial family. And then he bought that painting that's in the Met with the white horse um, through a Chinese dealer who acquired it when the um, imperial family was offloading a lot of the, their household goods. So he bought paintings that way, stamps and books, as well as ceramics. And then another collecting kind of sphere, I would say, was his scholarship. This is another defining feature of David. He was extremely active as a collector in terms of research and in terms of publishing his research. Most of his research publications focused on Chinese subjects, such as art, ceramics, stamps, and books. But I also discovered that he wrote a really interesting article about Dutch painting when he was in South Africa. He had, you know, a large catalog of his collection published in a really fine edition in 1934 with his own specially designed typeface. He wrote a preface to a Chinese photography book. Um, and he also was publishing in the stamp world literature, such as you can see, um, there was an article he wrote in the, the journal, The London Philatelist. He would use a lot of his collected things such as books and ceramics as kind of research data for his um, publication. And he would, whenever he was traveling, study collections in those places such as the Palace Museum in China, which he also helped um, pay for the refurbishment of pavilions when it was opening up to the public. For the first time, he visited the Imperial Repository in Japan, the Shoso Inn. He visited the former um, Ottoman Palace collection in the top copy, etc. And he also, even in um, the 1950s, was visiting Taiwan to see the new National Palace Museum. Plus, he was lecturing about Chinese art, Chinese ceramics, and it turns out stamps. Um, and 
one of the lectures he gave for the occasion of the 1935 exhibition apparently was standing room only. And the newspaper report said women were fainting and crying because they had to be turned away. It was so crowded. So it sounds like he was a very popular speaker as well. And then I briefly mentioned as part of his official biography that he engaged in a lot of philanthropic activity, but I actually until recently didn't know the full scope of this. And his philanthropy was often strategic, but it was equally often completely anonymous. So he began by donating objects and funds to museums, mainly as a way to, I think, develop relationships with those institutions and the curators. So he was quite important um, donor to the BNA. Um, the British Museum and other museum. But I then discovered that he was also extremely important as a supporter of the Warburg Institute. You can see the outside of it in the middle image on the left. The Warburg Institute is um, part of the University of London and it houses the most important library of medieval and Renaissance text. So it's really the, the kind of home of medieval and Renaissance studies, if you will. And it was founded by Abby Warburg of the Warburg banking family. It came to London from Germany after Hitler came to power and there was a lot of oppression. Um, so there was concern about the uh, safety of the collection. And so it, um, the University of London gave it a home. Um, and it's been an institute here at University of London ever since then. What I discovered in their archives was that during the Second World War, um, David housed not only his own collection, which had been on display in his rooms at the Dorchester Hotel, he housed that in his country estate for um, safety, but also one third of the Warburg Institute Library and um, a copy of, you know, the kind of security copy of the Warburg Institute catalog. So he was very important for protecting that because of course the whole, the area in which all these places were located was heavily bombed. He also, I discovered, anonymously supported a number of the people who are known as the refugee scholars. And these were Jewish scholars um, in this case of sort of arts and humanities who fled Germany and were given um, basically jobs at the University of London in order to provide support for them. And a number of them who are quite famous in the art world, including Aaron Scombrick, were um, supported anonymously by Percival David. They never knew. Um, and he never announced this. So that really tied in with um, his, I, the other type of philanthropy that I was able to discover that he was active in, which is, you know, supporting Jewish causes, including um, the, through the family fund, um, the building of a synagogue um, in London. So it wasn't just the Warburg Institute at University of London, he was engaging with and supporting, but he also, um, supported new degree programs and teaching posts and facilities. And the job I have now is really a result of the degree program that was founded with his funding in 1930 at what was then the School of Oriental Studies. And this was a degree in Chinese art and archaeology, first one in the world. Um, and over time that you know, had been maintained here at SOAS. So that established Chinese art as, as a field of academic research and teaching. He funded a teaching position. He founded a degree program at Hebrew University as it was. Um, he also founded the Conservation Institute at the Courtauld, which is the Art History Institute of the University of London. I also discovered he was supporting archaeology and archaeologists. Um, the famous archaeologist Leonard Woolley, one trip to Syria, 
was funded by Percival David. He, a Korean visitor to um, SOAS, recently told me that David funded the excavation of a Shilla tomb in Korea in the late 1920s. And he was also a supporter and member of the British School of Archaeology in Egypt. So, so many different areas in which he was engaged in philanthropy mirrors his, now what I can see are his wider interests and therefore his collections. So the last area I want to just briefly cover is one that we, we could have, we did know something about, but we didn't really know the full scope of it. And that's his participation in um, exhibitions as a director of the 1935 exhibition, which was a groundbreaking exhibition and really part of his aim to bring Chinese art to the attention of the world and to center knowledge of China, knowledge of Chinese art in China. That is, this exhibition wouldn't have gone ahead without loans from China in his view. And you can see him here with um, some of the Chinese curators, He's in the middle here. So he participated in that exhibition. He was the originator of it and director of it. But before that, he was lending his objects to his cousin Philip Sassoon's series of exhibitions, including one called Porcelain Through the Ages, which was installed in the house. You can see a painting of on the right where Philip Sassoon lived with his cousin, Sybil. Um, and Philip was very important at, as air minister in the Second World War. Um, he was a cousin of Percival David. And this is mentioned in newspaper reports about the exhibition, but we didn't really know about it. He participated in charity exhibitions, such as the 1938 China Campaign Exhibition, which was used to raise money for medical supplies for China. He sent objects to Toronto. He, of course, founded his own museum. And then after the museum opened, the museum was actively lending, but he had retained some collections with lending things to exhibition. But the one I recently discovered was the 1960 London International Stamp Exhibition, where David displayed his collection of Chinese stamps, and it was awarded a gold medal. And so there was some substantial literature about this, but um, I hadn't seen it mentioned anywhere. It was just by accident that I discovered it when I was looking into his stamp collection. And it was the first gold medal awarded to um, you know, an Asian stamp collection. So his exhibitions, his museum, they all also contribute to a much wider, broader, more detailed picture of who he was as a collector um, and how active he was as a collector in these multiple parts of you know, what I think we can call his collecting world or maybe his world. So I think, I hope you can see how these fears kind of intersect um, and to some extent overlap and how they made his whole collection and his collecting life possible. And maybe by looking at it through that lens, we can then hope to the next time Percival David's name is mentioned, think not just of the wonderful ceramics that were in his museum, but all the other areas in which he was collecting that were almost equally um, influential. And maybe realize that as a collector, um, he really managed to shape his life around his collecting activities. And so that's why I think I'm going to try to interpret him through a kind of collecting world lens. But I would be um, very happy to hear any feedback about that approach to the collection and whether 
hearing it today has helped illuminate who he was as a collector and what what his interests were and how these interests informed his life and his collecting activities. Thank you, Stacy. That was amazing. That was a really fascinating and um, multifaceted exploration of Percival David's life and collections. Um, so we'll move into the, the Q&A section. We've got one question at the moment waiting for us. I've got a couple of questions on, on the kind of back burner, but um, it's quite a long question. So I'll, I'll briefly, it's an interesting one, but I'll briefly summarize. Uh, so it's from um, Ian Clark, and he notes that we have two uh, punch bowls here in Sydney, early 19th century polychrome family rose enameled Chinese porcelain punch bowls. They're believed to have been decorated in Guangzhou before 1820 using Jing De Zhen blanks. Uh, one of them shows the eastern side of Sydney Cove. The other shows Dawes Point. Uh, Ian understands that this follows a convention in late 18th and early 19th century European topographical art of painting two views of the same scene from opposite vantage points to form what was called a harlequin pair, similar but not quite matching. They also have Aboriginal figures inside the, the bowls. That scene is identical. They're quite fascinating pieces. I'm quite fascinated by them too. Um, and he just wondered if you knew of any other examples of, of this kind of panoramic harlequin painting on porcelain. Wow, that is really interesting. Um, I wasn't aware of these, but I'm fascinated by the imagery. Um, so I have loads of questions about that pair, but um, I can think of, I mean, export art is not my area, but I can think of one that might be part of a Harlequin pair. It's in the um, Maritime Museum in London and it has, um, Okay, so this isn't my area, so I'm not using the right terminology, but it has an image of a port, um, which I believe is not Hong Kong, but somewhere else in Asia. And apparently someone who, who knows about these topographical images said that it would have been a similar to what you've just described as a Harlequin pair. Um, so it's kind of the museum website is not very good. Um, so if you're interested, I actually found an image of it and I could send you the details if you want to email me. Um, but apparently that is one that may be part of a Harlequin pair, um, which is a term that I didn't know until today. So thank you for enlightening me. That's the kind of connections we like to make. Um, a very generous of you to open yourself up to further questions. That's always good. We've got one more, another question come in from, from Les, who's Les Peterkin in Newcastle in New South Wales, who wants to know where we can go to see Percival David's ceramics collection. So you can see his ceramics collection in the British Museum. It's in its own gallery, um, which is called the Sir Percival David Collection, which is room 95. So um, if you're not in London, you can see a lot of it on the British Museum website. Um, there is a virtual tour of it, I think. So um, if you, so the British Museum website is a little bit difficult to navigate. So in the collection search box, if you put room 95, um, the Percival David will come up. Um, so there's, I mean, every piece is illustrated and there's an image online, um, but there is also a virtual tour and you can come to London hopefully and see it. So, I mean, there's a, a, a wonderful, range of books as well, many of which Stacey's written, which have um, lovely illustrations and um, captions and essays and things about the collection, especially some of the really fascinating, very significant objects like the Ruwer Bowl and the um, the Yongzheng bars and those kind of things. We, we don't have any open questions, so I might, oh, did you want to say something, Stacey? The other collections, though, are dispersed. So, um, you know, the, the biggest group of paintings is in the Metropolitan Museum of Art, so you can find them on their website, but um, everything else is pretty much dispersed around the world. And some pieces, I don't know where they've ended up because they ended up in private collections. Off in the way, unfortunately. <laughs> We've got a question from Nick, our wonderful Nicholas Crogan, 
who was wondering about your method of critical biography and how that might help us analyze broader questions about how knowledge about Chinese ceramics has been produced in UK and the US. Yes, um, that's something I'm obviously thinking about because I mean, you may not be surprised to hear I'm, I am currently writing a critical biography of David and his collection. So I'm, that's why I'm testing out different critical frameworks for it. But in in exploring this, um, I think it has led to some very interesting broader questions that might be applicable to um, looking at you know related collections or collections in general, um, not just in the UK and US, but you know, even in Asia. And um, one key question is, and it's more of a statement really, is how much collecting as an activity and collections as we as they are defined has impacted our approach to art history in the first place. Um, and to how we evaluate uh, collectors through their collection. Because um, in collecting studies, um, the temptation is very much to um, read the collector in the collection. And of course, that's just what I've done for the last half hour. <laughs> um, but, and I think that is one way of looking at it, but I think we also need to bear in mind that collections are a in themselves a concept um, and they are a construct as well. So when you read the collector in the collection, and particularly in a case like David, who defined his collection in, in a fairly narrow way, I think we need to bear that in mind that this was, um, we need to evaluate his selection process and his motivation for shaping the collection that he wished to be his legacy in the way that he did. Um, and I think we can possibly use that as an example for how we look at um, particularly collections that have entered the public space um, because they're the ones that have gained a kind of, they've become collections as they've entered that public space um, and they've become, a specifically defined collection, if that makes sense. So that's why I've been trying to separate David's museum collection from his collecting as a whole, because it, in my view, it's only, um, it only, it paints a very narrow picture of who he was and what he was collecting and also the world in which he was collecting that, that particular context. So I think, yes, um, those are some of the broad questions that we should we can act apply to you know thinking about how knowledge about collections has been produced over time. I think when Nick asked that, I was just thinking he's probably got in the back of his mind that we've got another event coming up next week. For those of you who are interested to find out more about critical writing a critical biography and that sort of thing, next Thursday, nineteenth of October at six thirty to eight p.m. I'm sure Nick will post a, a link in the chat. Um, the questions are coming in thick and fast now. I'll move on to Jennifer Su, who would like to know, why do you think Percival David's history is not widely known? Do you think the importance of his ceramic collection overshadows the man? Um, I think yes to the second question, but that was intentional on his part. Um, so that's why in the beginning of my talk, I said I referred to it as the authorized biography and the authorized history, because um, that's the history he wished to be known by or through. Um, I think if he wanted us to know more about the other things he collected, the other things he did, he would have he would have made that clear. Um, and so he wanted that collection to overshadow him as a person, but he wanted his name attached to the collection, of course, because he insisted that the museum be called the Percival David Foundation of Chinese Art. So there is an element of, well, I'd say a strong element of a very um, selective self-identity and identity shaping on his part. And that's why, um, we knew so little. I mean, just to give you an example, when I first started working at the museum, um, I 
I don't know what we were having a meeting about the collection and I said something about him being Jewish and everybody looked at me like I was crazy. Like it was something that had never, ever been articulated yet to me as a, as a kind of outsider, it was, it was such an obvious part of who he was. Um, but things like that. So, you know, he, he, he shaped the identity that we know him by. Um, and so the, um, collection overshadowing him was purely intentional. We've got a question from Olivier that he's put in the chat. Um, he's, Olivier is, is with us, but he's on a unstable connection and he's having some trouble maintaining it. But the question is a really fascinating one. So Olivier is curious about the amount of time and energy that Percival David dedicated to his collecting while also maintaining and developing his family business. And he wonders to what extent was the collecting part of those business affairs, thinking sort of about, I don't know anything about this, but about the tea circle Zaibatsu collectors in Japan at a similar time. Yeah, I'm I'm still trying to untangle that, frankly. Um, I know that his business activities um enabled collecting in terms of his travels and his location. Um, the business obviously gave him the funds to collect. But there does at this stage, in my research, there does not appear to be any um, official overlap between his business activities and his collecting activities. Um, nobody that I can see in his um, non-family, sphere of his collecting world knew anything about that business um, at all. So um, I can't see that, uh, oh, apart from one, maybe one example. Okay, so he was able to, in China, buy um, a number of ceramics that were formerly in the uh, palace collection. And they were sold off by a bank. So I mentioned that in my talk. but. The reason he was able to acquire these pieces from the bank is because it was a Sassoon bank. So, <laughs> so there you have quite a clear um, intersection between his business life and his collecting life. But that's the only concrete example I have at the moment. So I'm going to have to say I can't really answer that at this stage, but it's a good question that I am exploring. Uh, there's a couple questions. I might, I'll, I'll, Put aside Des's question for now, and I'll skip to Mark's just because I think it links more with what we're talking about. Mark Ledbury, who's the uh, director of the Power Institute, asks, how can we avoid hagiography in the history of collections? And can we truly take a critical view of collectors in the face of such apparent and real generosity? Really good question. And another thing I'm sort of grappling with is because I want to avoid that, because in my view, that's what we started with in the with the example of Percival David. And my goal is not to kind of knock him off his pedestal. My goal is to really illuminate um, his much more um, extensive act collecting activities and activities that were impactful, I think, you know, in good ways, but also possibly in not so good ways. Um, so there is that question, you know, does that matter? Um, should we not just embrace the history, the legacy that he crafted for himself? Um, or should we take that, you know, as I'm doing as a starting point for exploring his life and his collections in a much more critical way? Um, and it in doing a critical biography, it is difficult to avoid, you know, anything hagiographic. Hey, I mean, it's really difficult because collections lend themselves to that, you know, as 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 created entities. Um, and as you mentioned, they often come with um, generosity. So, I mean, there's a joke among some of us who do this that we always prefer dead collectors, but <laughs> It's only because um, it's difficult to have any kind of critical distance from your subject, you know, if a collector is still 
alive. Um, but equally, it's, you know, it's difficult too with dead collectors. So um, that one is something I actually, I hope to explore that issue a bit more in the workshop next week. I'll move on to uh, Jez's question. So you mentioned some huge prices for Percival Davy pieces that come to market. And uh, Jez wonders, is this the result of Chinese regathering their country's scattered works? Um, not necessarily. Um, David pieces, whatever they are, have always commanded a premium. And, you know, over time, I mean, a lot of, there are a lot more Chinese, well, until recently, there were a lot more Chinese buyers um, in the market for these really high value items. Um, but it's not the Chinese collectors, especially at that level, who are motivated by trying to, um, you know, recoup recoup the object losses that have been experienced in China. That has been more of an official um, government uh, campaign. So I can't. I mean, I haven't explored because often I can't who the buyers of some of the more recent things are, but they're not always Chinese. Um, and you know, my I've known a lot of collectors, Chinese collectors, over the years, and they. I, I think bar one never say that they're collecting David pieces because they're trying to get them back. And when I was running the museum, um, we never had a request for um, return of items ever. Um, in fact, um, when there was a campaign of trying to explore what happened to the Summer Palace objects, it was back in like 2005 or 2004 or something like that. And the Chinese government sent people all over UK, Europe, in the U.S. to find these objects, um, they they came to us, but only to ask where these objects were. Um, they weren't interested in you know David material coming back to China. So I would say in his in the case of his object, that's not the motivation, and that's not what's driving that activity. I think it's him as a provenance that's driving those prices. A uh, question from Steve Sheridan about the the, the title of the talk the man who loved China and wondering if it was a deliberate reference. Yeah, so I just borrowed it because, um, I mean, I can't use it obviously in a publication, but, you know, I, Winchester's book was great. Um, Needham is, you know, is a whole other kettle of fish. I mean, what a great subject to write a biography about. Also problematic, also um, difficult to avoid a hagiography hey of, or not, depending on how you look at him. Um, also an influential person, but yeah, so I just borrowed it for the talk. Um, it won't be the title of the book. And yes, I was very much inspired by Winchester's book. Um, was there another question about another book in that? I just saw Rose Carr's book. Oh, there was a, a reference to Needham's, um, the volume of the science and civilization in China that Rose Kerr and Nigel Wood uh, wrote on Chinese ceramics. Which was... And Julia is a fantastic book. I'm um, hard to get a hold of, but um, yeah, that's really a, a good connection to Needham because it's part of the Needham series. So if you haven't read Winchester's book, I highly recommend it. <laughs> um, this seems a good chance to pop in my question. I had a couple of questions. I'm, I'm very interested in collections and collecting and how collections are formed. So this has been fascinating to me. But what I wondered, I hadn't realized that Percival David collected stamps and books to the same extent as ceramics, or perhaps almost to the same extent. I wondered if he had different approaches to the way that he collected those things hmm. in terms of what he kind of wanted to achieve or his aims or the things that he looked for and the way he put together the, the structure of those collections. So, um, yeah, that's a good question because I was able to find in a lot of um, fairly obscure sources statements from David um, about the ceramics collection as it pertains to the museum collection. You know, so there was the odd statement about how he wanted it to be a systematic collection. But this is him shaping the identity of the collection when he's trying to when he's donating it to University of London. So that was intentional. But so he said. It, he wanted it to be systematic and it wanted he wanted it to complement um what his 
colleague, older colleague, Georgi Morfopoulos, had specialized in which was early Chinese ceramics, so Tang and earlier. So we have that. I haven't really found anything like that with regards to, apart from that one comment about paintings from him. So his paintings appear to be acquired. They're almost opportunistically acquired. I think if something comes up, he was buying it. But then I discovered a comment that he had actually commissioned a dealer in China to find a certain painting. And I believe he was successful in that because there was comment from other Chinese dealers um, about how annoyed they were that he had bought it and were taking it out, was taking it out of China. So he may have been doing that with paintings. Um, he obviously did that with ceramics. You know, he would tell a dealer, this is what I'm looking for. Stamps, I found no comment from him about at all, but other people have commented that in such a way that it sounds like he was also very systematic in his approach to collecting Chinese stamps. But I also discovered he started with um, British stamps or something like that. But um, so it does appear that he may have been approaching it in a similar way, but the books are different. The books I think he acquired because he wanted the literature of art of collecting um, in the original language and from the source of knowledge as he identified it. So he was very much centering it in China. And so that informed his book collecting. No, it's fascinating, but I mean, I mean, they're all such collectible objects. They're sort of the classic things that people collect. So <laughs> it makes sense. <laughs> um, oh, another question from Jez. Did he speak or read Chinese? I think he probably did. I'm not sure if he read Chinese. I mean, he could speak Chinese, but he definitely read it. Um, and the reason I know he read it is because um, in the library, his personal library that he donated to the university with the ceramics collection, you know, there were all of a lot of his books. And a lot of the books are in Chinese. And he used a pencil to um, write in his books and was often translating and it's very distinctive handwriting, um, you know, passages in the Chinese books. He um, spent many years doing a full translation of one of the books that he owned, which was um, the, he, it was published in translation as the um, essential criteria of collecting, which is the Gu Gu Yaolun from, you know, the 14th century. He translated that into English. Um, I'm not sure when he learned to read Chinese because in the very beginning of his ceramic collecting career, there are references to him or there are letters where he's written to a museum and asked if they could translate the inscription on a piece. But that that seems to stop around 1920. So I don't know how he learned it, but he definitely could read Chinese um, and maybe speak it, who knows. Another question that we've got a little bit of time left, but um, another question that occurred to me was, uh, I'm not sure, I think Chaitanya Sambrani is here tonight from the ANU, but he and I and a few other scholars are currently working on a project about Arthur Llewellyn Basham, who was also part of the SOAS um, family, was employed by SOAS and studied there. And one of the aspects of sort of a critical biography approach as well, I suppose, but one of the aspects of what we're looking at is the network of scholars that Basham was was uh, involved with and the people who he communicated with, the people who had influenced him, the people who followed him. Was there a similar, I mean, of course there was, but what, what, what can you tell us about the network of scholars that surrounded Percival David? Um, it was, it's an interesting question because he was engaging with scholars, but there's not that much evidence in terms of um, either sort of personal commentary about it or, you know, joint activities. He definitely belongs to a lot of groups um, that are, you know, populated by scholars like the archaeology groups and the Society of Antiquities um, and Royal Anthropological Institute. He is um, supporting 
scholars in their academic positions, in their research, so he must be engaging with them on that level. He was very much, though, in terms of his, his chosen and his defined subject area, very much a pioneer. And so he was the one that in his field, everyone seemed to look up to. Um, but I'm now finding with this stamp discovery that in the stamp world, he was more actively engaging with scholars. Um, it taking me a while to, to learn the language of that world, <laughs> even to pronounce philately. Um, but I believe in that world, yes, he was engaging with scholars. But bearing in mind with these types of objects, and I'm just going to include stamps as objects, it was often the owners, the collectors who were the scholars. Um, and that's true of Chinese archaeological material too, um, with some of the, you know, like Seligman, um, at, who was a um, academic at UCL, the college next to us. So it's a little bit of a murky picture at the moment, but definitely, yes. Um, I'm trying to fill in those details too. Brilliant. Well, um, thank you again. I think we're We've, we've run the course of questions, but you, thank you for your generosity in answering all our questions. And thank you for that wonderful talk. I'm very much looking forward to next week's event. Um, and thank you again for, for joining us, Stacey. And thank you to everyone who's in the audience as well for joining us. It was my pleasure. Thank you.